Before we start, I'd like to give a massive shout out to the following people for supporting Stories Telling Stories on Patreon. Jim Ross, Holly, Tamara, and Tom. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to help support the show and hear your name listed before future episodes, head on over to patreon.com slash stories telling stories. And we're back. Today is Friday, June 12th, 2020. And this is episode 11 of Locked in a Vacancy. No, you're not hearing things incorrectly. There was no episode 10. Due to what is going on in the world today in terms of uh, protests and standing up for Black Lives Matter, which we fully support here at uh, Stories Telling Stories and Locked in a Vacancy. I felt it inappropriate during the real heat of it last week to release an episode. There was just, there was so much important work going on, which is still going on now, mind you. I didn't want to take away from that or detract any sort of lighter attention from the important work being done in the streets globally right now. So episode 10 is gone. It is being purposefully left out of the entire series just as a standing tribute to the silenced voices that have been putting up and suffering in silence for literally hundreds of years. So episode 11, Locked in a Vacancy, we are looking at a, a very interesting female author who hails from New Zealand. Catherine Mansfield lived a pretty interesting life as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, and, a, and an unfortunately short one as well. We're looking at a short story of hers called Miss Brill, which is something I was not familiar with until I started doing research for this, uh, this series. But again, I'm glad I did. Uh, she lived a short but fascinating life. Uh, Catherine Mansfield was a poet and short story writer of the modernist style, uh, born and raised in colonial New, colonial New Zealand. But unfortunately, like so many influential artists, her time on Earth was short, losing her young life to tuberculosis at the relatively young age of 34. She died leaving behind an impressive body of work, which took years of editing and preparation for her estranged spouse, John Middleton Murray, to publish. But I'm sure, gl I'm sure glad that he did. Uh, after she moved to England in 1919, uh, she began rubbing elbows uh, with a rel uh, who's who in the writing community and developed notable friendships with authors D.H. Lawrence and Virginia Woolf, amongst others. But she had a streak of wanderlust in her, as so many young people do, and she traveled around Europe in her formative years, adopting somewhat of a bohemian lifestyle and befriending famous writers and artists everywhere she went. She was uh, often praised by her peers for her, quote, vicarious and charismatic approach to life and work. She absorbed the works of Oscar Wilde and Anton Chekhov, and although her exposure to the later did earn her accusations of plagiarism due to how it influenced her own work, but that's besides the point. Uh, she was also an unabashed bisexual, and her relationships with women found places of prominence in her journal entries and even in her work, as she often took to writing about her lovers and uh, those who she had official relationships with um, under pseudonyms. But her sexuality became a point of contention between her mother and herself, and her mother would later write her out of her will. But there's a few years in there, really in the thick of it, between her, her lovers, her relationships, her two marriages, her mother, that there's not a whole lot written. And in that period, she only published one poem and one story, but... There's a very interesting and juicy bit of history there that's just sort of missing. It's sort of glazed over in her history, involving her relationships, getting pregnant, marrying, 
a different man than the one that got her pregnant, but she never consummated that relationship and then divorcing and her mother blaming her lesbian relationships for that relationship failing and being sent away and then miscarrying after she was sent away and 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 all this, all of that, the traveling, the relationships, that was all before she turned 21. <laughs> She, she lived a very fast and very interesting life. And, you know, one may say the fact that she only lived to 34, she did live a full life regardless. Because <laughs> by, by the time she was 21, she had already lived a much more interesting life than a lot of us even live entirely. And I know this is more in line with how I present stories telling stories than locked in a vacancy, but I found Catherine Mansfield's brief story to be fascinating and worth sharing. And while it's true her life was short, she lived it. And all that above doesn't even bring her story up to the First World War or the latter half of her life living with tuberculosis and desperately trying to find a cure. I will mention that, though. Uh, she was so desperate for a cure that she began seeking out radical and experimental treatments for the disease. And in February of 1922, she consulted the Russian physicist Ivan Manushkin, whose revolutionary treatment consisted of bombarding her spleen with X-rays, which caused Mansfield to develop a host of side effects, including uh, heat flashes and numbness in her legs. Ugh. When I was younger, my grandfather once told me some stories about his own struggle with uh, tuberculosis when he was in a Navy hospital during the Second World War. And just hearing some of his stories, I honestly can't say I blame her for being desperate to find a cure. But ultimately, she would succumb to what the... Uh, what the tuberculosis infection would do to her body uh, in a secondary sort of way. She, uh, she died on January 9th, 1923. Uh, after running up a flight of stairs, uh, she suffered a pulmonary embolism, and that, unfortunately, is what ended her life. Uh, she was buried in, uh, in Nice, France, and one would think that would be the end of her story. But it's not. Catherine Mansfield's story continued to live on after her death, as her work continued to be released posthumously and has been appreciated by each new generation of readers looking to her language and her unique voice. And she's also been the subject herself of new work, uh, paintings, schools in her native New Zealand named in her honor, uh, being the subject of TV shows and movies. And she was no, most notably portrayed by Vanessa Redgraves in a BBC miniseries about her life in 1973. So while she's been gone nearly a hundred years, Catherine Mansfield's extraordinary short story, through appreciation of her short stories, continues to ensure that her legacy lives on. So today, in celebration of the fascinatingly short life that Catherine Mansfield lived, we are going to dive into one of her short stories, one that deals with loneliness, isolation, and solitude. This is Miss Brill, Unlocked in a Vacancy, right here on Stories Telling Stories. Although it was so brilliantly fine, the blue sky powdered with gold and great spots of light, like white wine splashed over the Jardines public. Miss Brill was glad that she had decided on her fur. The air was motionless, but when you opened your mouth, there was just a faint chill, like a chill from a glass of iced water before you sip. And now and again, a leaf came drifting from nowhere from the sky. Miss Brill put up her hand and touched her fur dear little thing. It was nice to feel it again. She had taken it out of its box that afternoon, shaken out the moth powder, given it a good brush, and rubbed the life back into the dim little eyes. What had been happening to me, said the sad little eyes. 
Oh, how sweet it was to see them snap at her again from the red eider down. But the nose, which was some sort of black composition, wasn't at all firm. It must have had a knock somehow. Never mind. A little dab of black sealing wax when the time came, when it was absolutely necessary. <sighs> little rogue. Yes, she really felt like that about it. Little rogue biting its tail just by her left ear. She could have taken it off and laid it on her lap and stroked it. She felt a tingling in her hands and arms, but that came from walking, she supposed. And when she breathed, something light and sad, no, not sad exactly, something gentle seemed to move in her bosom. There were a number of people out this afternoon, far more than last Sunday, and the band sounded louder and gayer. That was because the season had begun. For although the band played all the year round on Sundays, out of season it was never the same. It was like someone playing with the family to listen. It didn't care how it played if there weren't any strangers present. Wasn't the conductor wearing a new coat, too? She wasn't sure it was new. He scraped with his foot and flapped his arms like a rooster about to crow, and the bandsmen sitting in the green rotunda blew out their cheeks and glared at the music. Now there came a little fluty bit. Oh, very pretty. A little chain of bright drops. She was sure it would be repeated. It was. She lifted her head and smiled. Only two people shared her special seat. A fine old man in a velvet coat, his hands clasped over a huge carved walking stick, and a big old woman sitting upright with a roll of knitting on her embroidered apron. They did not speak. This was disappointing for Miss Brill, always looking forward to the conversation. She had become really quite expert, she thought, at listening. As though she didn't listen. At sitting in other people's lives just for a minute while they talked round her. She glanced, sideways, at the old couple. Perhaps they would go soon. Last Sunday, too, hadn't been as interesting as usual. An Englishman and his wife, uh, he was wearing a dreadful Panama hat and she buttoned boots. And she'd gone on the whole time about how she ought to wear spectacles. She knew she needed them. But it had no good, but she had no good getting any. They'd be sure to break and they'd never keep on. And he'd been so patient. He'd suggested everything. Gold rims, the kind that curved around your ears, little padding inside the bridge. No, 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 nothing would please her. They'll always be sliding down my nose. <laughs> Miss Brill had wanted to shake her. The old people sat on the bench, still as statues. Never mind. There was always the crowd to watch. To and fro, in front of the flower beds and the band rotunda, the couples and groups paraded, stopped to talk, to greet, to buy handfuls of flowers from the old beggar who had his tray fixed to the railings. Little children ran among them, swooping and laughing. Little boys with big white silk bows under their chins. Little girls, little French dolls dressed up in velvet and lace. And sometimes a tiny staggerer came suddenly rocking into the open from under the trees stopped, stared, and suddenly sat down, flop, until its small, high-stepped mother, like a young hen, rushed, scolding to its rescue. Other people sat on benches and green chairs, but they were nearly always the same, Sunday after Sunday. And Miss Brillet often noticed there was something funny about nearly all of them. They were odd, silent, nearly all old, and from the way they stared, they looked as though they'd just come from dark little rooms, or, or even cupboards. Behind the rotunda, the slender trees with yellow leaves down drooping, and through them just a line of sea, and beyond the blue sky with gold-veined clouds. Tum, 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 tiddle-um, tiddle -um. tum, tiddly tum, tum, ta, blew the band. Two young girls in red came by, and two young soldiers in blue met them, and they laughed and paired and went off arm in arm. Two peasant women with funny straw hats passed gravely, leading beautiful smoke-colored donkeys. 
a cold, pale nun hurried by. A beautiful woman came along and dropped her bunch of violets, and a little boy ran after the hand them to her, and she took them and threw them away as, as if they'd been poisoned. Dear me, Miss Brill knew not whether to admire that or not. And now an ermine toque and a gentleman in grey met just in front of her. He was tall, stiff, dignified, and she was wearing the ermine toque she'd brought when her hair was yellow. Now everything, her face, her hair, even her eyes, was the same color as the shabby ermine, and her hands, in its cleaned glove, lifted to dab her lips, was the tiny yellowish paw. Oh, she was so pleased to see him, delighted! She'd rather, though, they were going to meet that afternoon. She described where she'd been. Everywhere, here, there, along the sea. The day was so charming, didn't he agree? And wouldn't he, perhaps? But he shook his head, lighted a cigarette, slowly breathed a great deep puff into her face, and even while she was still talking and laughing, flicked the match away and walked on. The ermine toque was alone. She smiled more brightly than ever, but even the band seemed to know what she was feeling and played more softly, more tenderly. And the drum beat, the brute, the brute, over and over. What would she do? What was going to happen now? But as Miss Brill wondered, the ermine toque turned, raised her hand as though she'd seen someone else, much nicer, just over there, and pattered away. And the band charged again and played more quickly, more gaily than ever, and the old couple on Ms. Brill's seat got up and marched away. Such a funny old man with long whiskers hobbled along in time to the music and was nearly knocked over by four girls walking abreast. Oh, how fascinating it was. How she enjoyed it. How she loved sitting there, watching it all. It was like a play. It was exactly like a play. Who would believe the sky at the back wasn't painted? But it wasn't till a little brown dog trotted on solemn, then slowly trotted off like a little theater dog, a little dog that had been drugged, that Miss Brill discovered what it was that made it so exciting. They were all on the stage. They weren't only the audience. Not only looking on, they were acting. Even she had a part and came every Sunday. No doubt somebody would have noticed if she hadn't been there. She was part of the performance after all. How strange she'd never thought of it like that before. And yet it explained why she made such a point of starting from home at just the same time every week, so as not to be late for the performance. And it also explained why she had quite a queer, shy feeling at telling her English pupils how she spent her Sunday afternoons. <laughs> No wonder. Miss Brill nearly laughed out loud. She was on the stage. She thought of the old invalid gentleman to whom she read the newspaper four afternoons a week while he slept in the garden. She had got quite used to the frail head on the cotton pillow, the hollowed eyes, the open mouth and the high-pinched nose. If he'd been dead, she mightn't have noticed for weeks. She wouldn't have minded. But suddenly, he knew he was having the paper read to him by an actress. An actress! The old head lifted, two points of light quivering in the old eyes. An actress, are ye? And Miss Brill smoothed the newspaper, as though it were the manuscript of her part, and said gently, Yes, I have been an actress for a long time. The band had been having a rest. Now they started again. And what they played was warm, sunny, yet there was just a faint chill, a something, what was it? Not sadness, no, not sadness, a something that made you want to sing. The tune lifted, lifted, the light shone, and it seemed to Miss Brill that in another moment, all of them, all the whole company would begin singing. The young ones, the laughing ones who were moving together, they would begin, and the men's voices, very resolute and brave, would join them. And then she too, she too and the others on the benches, they would come in with a kind of accompaniment, 
something low that scarcely rose or fell, something so beautiful, moving. And Miss Brill's eyes filled with tears, and she looked smiling at the other members of the company. Yes, we understand. We understand, she thought. Though what they understood, she didn't know. Just at that moment, a boy and a girl came and sat down where the old couple had been. They were beautifully dressed. They were in love. The hero and heroine, of course, just arrived from his father's yacht and still soundlessly singing, still with that trembling smile, Miss Brill prepared to listen. No, not now, said the girl. Not here, I can't. But why? Because of that stupid old thing at the end there? Asked the boy. Why does she come here at all? Who wants her? Why doesn't she keep her silly old mug at home? It's her foofer, which is so funny, <laughs> giggled the girl. It's exactly like a fried whiting. Ah, <laughs> uh, be off with you, said the boy in an angry whisper. Then, tell me, ma petite chérie. No, not here, said the girl. <laughs> not yet. On her way home, she usually bought a slice of honey cake at the baker's. It was her Sunday treat. Sometimes there was an almond in her slice. Sometimes not. It made a great difference. If there was an almond, it was like carrying home a tiny present. A surprise. Something that might very well not have been there. She hurried on the almond Sundays and struck the match for the kettle in quite a dashing way. But today, she passed the baker's by, climbed the stairs, went into the little dark room, her room like a cupboard, and sat down on the red eider down. She sat there for a long time. The box that the fur came out of was on the bed. She unclasped the necklet quickly, quickly without looking, laid it inside. But when she put the lid on, she thought she heard someone crying. The End Locked in a Vacancy is produced in collaboration with Stories Telling Stories and STS Media Group, socially isolating itself at Milt House Studios in Milton, Vermont, casting around the globe to your frontal lobe wherever podcasts are found. Locked in a Vacancy is also streaming on YouTube at Stories Telling Stories. Make sure to give us a review wherever you stream our show. We really appreciate it. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Give us a subscribe on YouTube and consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. And until next time, stay sane, stay safe, and stay whimsical. <laughs>